So, in order to get started, I'm going to start right away with a formula that we're not going to use too often, but is really the key. It is literally the uh, foundation of everything we're going to do this term. And the idea is the following, all right? So here's the key equation underlies everything we're going to do. And I'll explain every term in it. Okay, so here it is. So this V stands for velocity. And this is time, T is time. And this little delta T is a small change in time. Okay. The F here stands for force, and we'll learn a lot more about what that means. And the M stands for mass. All right, the mass of an object. And we will be using in this course something called the particle model, because physics is really just about building models, where we think of every object as having, being just a point in space with some mass. Right? And that object can move around. So what does this say? What does this formula say? It says that the velocity after a little bit of time is exactly equal to what it was at an earlier time, slightly earlier time, plus something, the force divided by mass, times delta t, that changes that velocity. This is one way of writing Newton's second law. It may not look what you have seen, perhaps in high school, but really this is far more useful, even though we're not going to use it very much in this course. The reason why this is useful is this is the foundation for almost all numerical calculations involving particles. It's the foundation for simulations of molecules in the air or molecules in a glass of water. It's the foundation for the simulation of planets going around the sun and asteroids going around the sun. It's the foundation for stars moving around galaxies. It's also the foundation for galaxies moving themselves. So this is a very important foundational law. What we will do is we'll take a limit where delta t gets smaller and smaller, and we'll write down what you probably have seen as the usual F e Newton's second law. So this is a starting point. Let's see what it means a little better. The first thing to notice is this law is about how velocity changes. This was a great innovation that Newton saw. It was his biggest insight, and that is you need something, some interaction, some force, not to move a particle, but to change its motion, to change its velocity. That's what forces do. And that led to a completely different way of looking at motion. It is different than, for instance, what Aristotle thought. The Greeks, they all thought you needed forces just to keep an object in motion. But you don't. If you're out in the middle of outer space and you're moving with a certain velocity, you do not need anything to keep moving at that same velocity. You will just keep going. Why was that so hard to see? Because there are many forces on Earth that we don't recognize as forces so much, mostly those forces are frictional forces. But they really are forces. And they are the ones that cause objects to slow down, come to a stop. And that's why we need other forces to keep objects motion, moving near the surface of the Earth. Now, let's take this. If we let delta T be smaller and smaller, all right, then you might recognize if I divide through by delta T, I move this V of t over there, I can get something that you might recognize a little more. The acceleration is equal to F over n. Right? And this is basically V of t plus delta t 
minus V of T divided by delta T. All right? And then you take a limit like you may be learning about in calculus. This is called the acceleration. And again, like I said before, acceleration is the change in velocity divided by the change in time. So what forces do is cause acceleration. That's what they do directly. They do not cause velocity directly. It's acceleration. So that is very important. Now, one of the things that we notice on the surface of the Earth, so near the surface of the Earth, the motion of particles or objects is the same for all mass. So it doesn't matter whether an object is big or small. All right? So I have two pieces of chalk here. If I drop them or threw them with the same initial velocity, they would have identical motion doesn't depend on their mass. Well, how can that be true if this equation is true and this equation is true? Well, the answer is that near the surface of the Earth, the force that exists, which we now know is gravity, that force, the force of gravity, I can raise F sub G, that must equal some mass times a constant g. So this is a constant, okay? And I'm going to put a minus sign there, okay? And explain what that means. So we know that must be true. The reason why that must be true is that this mass must be canceled out by the force, okay? So that the acceleration then becomes this implies that the A is just minus G. All right. Now, in high school, you probably were told G was the acceleration due to gravity. I hate that term. What G really is, is a gravitational field. So this is the gravitational field at the surface of the Earth. All right. And we usually think of G as a positive number, so we put a minus sign to indicate that the field is downwards. It's toward the center of the Earth. Okay? So this is the force of gravity, and that's the gravitation. And we can measure this in various units. In the MKS system, meters, kilograms, seconds. Acceleration is in meters per second squared. If I look at G, G is F over M, all right? So that's newtons per mass, all right? Or newtons per kilogram, all right? And so we see, if I just look at this, I can see that a newton is just equal to the mass per second square, uh, to meters per second square times kilograms, all right? So this is the MKS system. So we now know what the unit of acceleration is. We know what the unit of force is. Mass has units of kilograms. Velocity has units of meters per second. Position has units of meters. That's if we measure everything in the MKS system. All right. Now we can use this in a very interesting way, without knowing anything about detailed formulas or anything, we can then learn something about the results of experiments without much theory at all, using something called dimensional analysis. So the key idea of dimensional analysis, let's say we want to know something, like I want to know how much time it takes for this chalk to fall to the ground. 
I figure out what that must depend on. All right? So obviously it depends on how high it is off the ground. All right? We'll call that, let's say, L. So time for object to fall to the ground. So we have an object here. Here's the ground. There's L. All right. Well, clearly, that time must depend on L, all right? It has to depend on how high it is off the ground. What else is it? What else could it depend on? Well, there's nothing else in the problem except G. We know that mass doesn't matter. We've already talked about that. Mass doesn't matter. There's no initial velocity, so that can't matter. So the only thing that can matter is g. So how in the world am I going to get something that's in seconds based on something that's in le a length? And then what else do we have? Actually, let's use meters here to indicate length. And then uh, g is in meters per second squared, so I have meters divided by second squared. So how can I get this out of this? Well, the answer is pretty clear. I have to get this second squared on top, so it means I have to divide by g. And then I have to cancel these two meters this is meters per second squared. So in order to cancel the meters, I have to put the length here. So now, when I do this, this has units of 1 over 1 over second squared, or second squared. So in order to get rid of that, make it a second squared, I take the square root. So we've now discovered that the time must be somewhat related to the square root of L over G. Notice I didn't use any physics, really. I just used dimensional analysis, what the quantities must depend on. That's all I did. All right? And it turns out this is pretty accurate. I don't know what's in front. It could, the time could be equal to 2 times this, the square root of 2, 1 over 2. I don't know. But I do know that it must depend on the square root of L over G. So that's a powerful statement. Engineers use this all the time because frequently they're dealing with situations and it's too complicated. They can't figure out a real theory of things. So in order to get a rough idea of what things will depend on, they will use dimensional analysis. All right, let's do one more example just to see how this works. So th this example will look very similar to the one we just did. And it'll be basically because of dimensional analysis. I have a pendulum here. It has a length L, and it's moving back and forth, back and forth. And I want to know what is the period of oscillation. Well, again, I have t, so that's in seconds. And again, the only thing it can depend on is L and G. So we know that t must go exactly the same as before, L over G. That's pretty amazing that the period of a Oscillation has the same dependence as me just dropping an object. And that's all because of dimensional analysis. Again, the constant in front is different here. And in this case, I believe this is 2 pi. So I believe this is how it goes. So it's actually 2 pi times the square root of L over G, right? And the reason why pi comes in is because 
this pendulum is doing some kind of motion that's kind of like trigonometry, all right? And trigonometry is related to circles, and circles have pi in them. Okay, so that's the basic idea of dimensional ML. Mm -hmm.